The French are on the move again, sir. Our scouts report they're heading down the Ohio Valley with a sizable force of regulars, Canadian militia and their Indian allies. Colonel George Washington looked up from the dispatch in his hands. His brow furrowed in concern. The young commander of the Virginia militia sat astride his horse at the head of a column of blue-coated colonial troops, called up to defend the frontier against the latest French incursion. It was the summer of 1754 and tensions between Britain and France over control of the North American interior were rapidly escalating toward open warfare. For decades, the two great European powers had jousted through a series of dynastic conflicts and proxy wars fought by their colonial proxies. But now the French, in a bold move, had begun constructing a line of forts in the disputed Ohio country, threatening to hem in the British coastal colonies and block their westward expansion. As a loyal subject of the British crown governing Virginia, Governor Robert Dinwiddie had tasked Washington with investigating these French maneuvers and, if necessary, repelling them by force. The tall, strapping 22-year-old colonel was determined not to fail in his duty, despite his youth and relative inexperience. How far away is the enemy? Lieutenant, Washington asked his scout, fighting to keep the nervousness from his voice. No more than a day's march, sir. They'll likely reach Fort Duquesne by tomorrow eve. Fort Duquesne, the linchpin of the French position, strategically situated where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers joined to form the Ohio. Washington knew if the French consolidated their hold on that vital junction, evicting them would prove a formidable challenge. He had to act quickly. Ready the men, he ordered. We march within the hour. I want our force in position to contest the French advance by nightfall. As aides scurried to make preparations, Washington gazed westward, picturing the uncharted expanses that lay beyond the green wall of forest. Out there, a vast continent beckoned, ripe for the taking. But first, the French interlopers would have to be dealt with. Fate had placed him at the vanguard of this momentous struggle and Washington was determined to make his mark. By dusk, the Virginia militia had taken up concealed positions along the military road connecting Fort Duquesne with the French rear. Spread out in small groups amid the dense forest to avoid presenting a concentrated target, the colonials waited for the enemy's approach. Mosquitoes buzzed incessantly and the air hung heavy with humidity as the summer sun dipped below the horizon. Washington wiped a film of sweat from his brow, senses heightened, adrenaline pumping through his veins. Soon the sound of tramping feet and jangling equipment could be heard in the distance. The French column was on its way, marching in standard formation with regulars at the head, followed by the Canadian levies and Indian scouts ranging the woods on either flank. As the enemy drew near, Washington hissed orders to hold fire until the command was given. Muskets were primed, the glowing tips of burning match cords shielded to avoid detection. Hearts pounding, the militiamen gripped their weapons with white knuckles, many seeing combat for the first time. When the French vanguard was nearly abreast of the colonial position, Washington shouted, Fire! A ragged volley crashed out from a hundred hidden muskets. Balls whizzed through the gathering darkness, striking down a dozen French soldiers in a spray of blood. Cries of alarm in French filled the air as the column staggered to a disorganized halt, struggling to pinpoint their unseen attackers amid the gloom and foliage. The Indian auxiliaries instinctively melted into the undergrowth while the regulars and militia fumbled to reload their weapons and form a line. Charge! Washington bellowed and the Virginia frontiersmen, unleashing a hair-raising rebel yell, swept out of the tree lean in a headlong rush, muskets clubbed and hunting knives flashing. They slammed into the half-formed French ranks with the fury of a summer gale, stabbing and hacking with primeval savagery. For a few chaotic minutes, the two sides grappled in confused, hand-to-hand -hand combat until the French line buckled and then broke apart. White-coated soldiers bolted into the woods in panic, flinging aside their weapons and gear in their flight. One French officer attempted to rally his troops for a stand, but Washington put a pistol ball between his eyes, pitching him lifeless from the saddle. As quickly as it began, the brief, violent clash was over. Washington's ambush had carried the day, scattering the French column and sending the survivors reeling back the way they came. A ragged cheer went up from the colonials as they surveyed the carnage, 
Over 50 French bodies littered the road amid discarded muskets and packs. Their own losses amounted to just a handful of men. It was a signal victory. Well done, lads. The French will think twice about trespassing on Virginia soil again. Let's gather up their arms and supplies and head for home. There will be celebrating tonight. As the triumphant militia collected the spoils and started the march back to their frontier forts, none could have guessed this minor skirmish deep in the American wilderness would light the fuse for a global conflagration. But the Battle of Jumonville Glen, as it came to be known, was a clarion call that the long-simmering rivalry between Britain and France for supremacy in North America had finally boiled over into war. News of the clash galvanized both sides. The French branded Washington an assassin, claiming his attack on a peaceful diplomatic mission was a flagrant violation of European conventions. The British hailed him as a hero for his bold strike against perfidious Gallic aggression. As tensions ratcheted higher, the two powers hurried to reinforce their colonial possessions, dispatching thousands of troops across the Atlantic. By the spring of 1755, the crackle of musketry and thunder of cannonade reverberated along the entire frontier as British redcoats and colonial provincials grappled with French regulars and their tribal allies for control of the continent. Despite their superior numbers, the Anglo-American forces were ill-prepared for the challenges of wilderness campaigning. Supply lines strained to breaking point over the rugged terrain, the colonists bickered over strategy and lacked a unified command, and British generals like Edward Braddock stubbornly clung to European methods ill-suited for the American environment. Braddock's attempt to mount a conventional military expedition and seize Fort Duquesne in 1755 ended in catastrophe when his redcoat column was ambushed and routed by a smaller French and Indian force fighting guerrilla style from the woods. Over 900 British soldiers were cut down in the massacre. It was a stinging setback. But the British would learn from their mistakes. Under Secretary of State William Pitt's energetic leadership, Anglo-American armies steadily adapted their tactics and logistics to overcome the particular impediments of the American theater. Pitt poured manpower and resources into the colonial war effort on an unprecedented scale, raising new regiments in the colonies, deploying growing numbers of British regulars, and covering most of the costs to keep the provincials in the field. Colonial commanders like Washington evolved their methods, too. His Virginia regiment developed expertise in frontier skirmishing and scouting that made them invaluable auxiliaries to the British regulars. Other colonial units like Rogers Rangers specialized in the skulking way of war, as Indian-style tactics were known, launching long-range raids and counterstrikes deep into French territory. No longer were the colonists playing second fiddle to the Redcoats, they were partners in the fight. This new unified strategic framework, combining the discipline and combined arms superiority of British regulars with the frontier skills and local knowledge of the provincials soon began bearing fruit. In 1758, a British amphibious expedition systematically reduced the mighty French bastion of Louisbourg guarding the St. Lawrence River, cutting off the French forces in Canada from seaborne supply and reinforcement. That same year, a mixed British colonial army under General John Forbes, in a model display of wilderness campaigning, hacked a road through 200 miles of uncharted forest to at last capture the pivotal Fort Duquesne, rechristened Pittsburgh in honor of the architect of victory. Though seriously outnumbered, Washington and his Virginians had played a vital role in the expedition's success. The following summer, Britain delivered the crushing blow. In a daring amphibious landing, Major General James Wolfe's Redcoat battalions scaled the cliffs of Quebec City by night to confront the French under Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham. In the ensuing battle, won by the devastating volleys of Wolfe's superbly drilled infantry, both commanders fell mortally wounded. But Quebec, linchpin of French Canada, was taken. The rest of the province surrendered the next year. The resounding British triumph in America was but one front of a world war raging from Germany to India. When peace finally came with the 1763 Treaty of Paris, the French had been expelled completely from North America, the continent's eastern half now under firm British control. In a few short years, an imperial backwater had been transformed into the crown jewel of a globe-spanning empire. And the colonists had gained new confidence from their essential contributions to this epical victory. But as is often the case, military success bred the seeds of future trouble. Friction over the costs and policies of consolidating Britain's vast new territories steadily estranged colonial opinion. 
Many provincials resented being subordinated to British authority after fighting alongside the Redcoats as relative equals. They chafed against new taxes and restrictions imposed by Parliament and the Crown to cover war debts and regulate westward expansion. In 1775, these smoldering resentments finally ignited into revolution. As colonial militiamen exchanged fire with British regulars at Lexington and Concord, a new chapter began in the American saga. One written in the blood of patriots and redcoats spilled on Bunker Hill and Saratoga and Yorktown as the world turned upside down. Now hailed as the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, George Washington would again lead American citizen soldiers into battle against the British, this time fighting for liberty and independence rather than king and empire. And the hard lessons of the French and Indian War, the importance of unity of effort, mastering irregular tactics, securing local support, and operating over long distances with scant resources would loom large. For the colonial crucible had not just forged a crack American fighting force but a core of battle-tested leaders with the skills to prevail against a formidable redcoat adversary. So as the sun rose over a nation newly born on July 4, 1776, its future remained perilously uncertain. But the colonists had been well-schooled in the ways of war, and they would be led by a general who had once fought deep in an American wilderness, in the vanguard of an earlier world-altering conflict. A general named Washington, more familiar than most with the steep and thorny path to ultimate victory.